Hello. This is the midweek Advent service for the first week in Advent. As we've entered a new church year, you will probably recognize that there's a little bit different tone to our worship services during this time of year. The season of Advent is a time of waiting, of a time, it's a time of expectation. The prayer for the Christian during this time of year is, Come, Lord Jesus. This is a prayer that has been prayed by Christians throughout history. In the Old Testament, their prayer was one of expectation and waiting. Come, Lord, the Messiah. That's who they were waiting for. Today, as we look at the, the world around us, we long for Jesus to come back. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing, let us speak praise to your name, O Most High. Let us herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of day. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. We confess our sins. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own grievous fault. And so I pray, God Almighty, have mercy on me. Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. A reading from Psalm 91 for this Advent season. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. If you make the Most High your dwelling, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. As we turn to our lesson for this week, our reading is from Genesis chapter 6. This is the Old Testament supplemental reading, the extra reading for the Old Testament for this past Sunday's Advent service. This is what happened when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth. When daughters were born to people, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took as wise for themselves any of them they chose. The Lord said, My spirit will not struggle with man forever because he is only flesh. His days will be 120 years. The Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that all the thoughts and plans they formed in their hearts were only evil every day. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with sorrow. The Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, along with the animals, the creeping things, and the birds of the sky, because I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account about the development of Noah's family. Noah was a righteous man, a man of integrity in that generation. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In the sight of God, the earth was morally corrupt and the earth was filled with violence. God looked at the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh was corrupt in all their ways on the earth. So God said to Noah, I have decreed the end of all flesh, 
because the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Seal it inside and outside with pitch. I myself am about to bring a flood of waters on the earth in order to destroy all flesh under the sky that has the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth will die, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You shall bring a pair, male and female, of every kind of living flesh into the ark with you to keep them alive. Include the birds according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, every creeping thing on the ground according to their kinds. Two of every sort shall come to you so you can keep them alive. Take with you every type of food that is eaten and store it for yourself so it can be used for food as food for you and for them. So this is what Noah did. He did everything that God commanded him just as he had been told. This is the word of our God. Imagine living in a world where you look around you at the culture and you see moral decay and you see no sign of improvement. As for you, you try to live as you know you should, but you see yourself giving into the culture around you with, with attitudes that you know are not born of Christian love. You see violence in the world around you. You're scared to go places because you don't know if it's safe. You don't know what the future holds, if your future is safe. You see attacks on God's church that seem to be hitting closer and closer to the mark. In times like these, what does a Christian do? Where, where does a Christian go? We are in the new church year, the new, new season of Advent. The traditional prayer of the church that we had for this last Advent Sunday, it really sums up the struggle that we Christians face in this world. We pray to stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The answer to what a Christian does when the future is uncertain, when you're waiting for the advent, the coming of our Lord, the answer for a Christian is to flee to Christ. Because your future is safe with Christ. These problems that we face in our world today, they're really nothing new. Mankind, from the fall of Adam and Eve up till today, have the same sin problem. Christians across history have had the same doubts, have had the same fear, have had the same prayer about the future. Where our account in, in Genesis picks up in chapter 6, this is generations after Adam and Eve. In those in-between generations, mankind had multiplied on the earth. But in those years that had passed, there was a problem, wasn't there? Moses describes this time in our reading this morning as a time full of violence, a time that is, is morally corrupt. And he makes it pretty clear how that happened, doesn't he? He says, the sons of God married the daughters of men. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled over, over time about what this could possibly mean from, from stories of some pre-flood version of humanity that were giants to theories about fallen angels having, having kids with human beings and having demigod-like offspring. And, and while those theories make for some very, very interesting storytelling, there's a much easier explanation, a much easier understanding. The sons of God. In short, they're Christians. Just like we, as Christians, we are called sons or, or children of God. These were pre-incarnate Christ Christians. People who had had that promise of the Savior, which God had given to Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. They had had that promise passed down generation to generation, father to child, child 
to the next generation. They trusted that God would one day take care of the problem of evil. But in running their Christian race, they, they stumbled. They got distracted by the beauty of the daughters of men and, and married them. These daughters of men stand in opposition in the sentence to the sons of God. In short, they were unbelievers. And when you have a marriage where one spouse is a Christian and, and one spouse isn't, well, that doesn't always lend itself to the most ideal environment for kids to be brought up in the training and instruction of the Lord so that when they grow old, they will not stray from it, right? If one parent doesn't make time to gladly hear and learn God's word, sometime in their young life, those kids are going to ask why they have to go to church when mom or, or dad doesn't. And some of these kids, by, by God's grace, will have his word work in their hearts and convince them of their continuing need for God's word in their lives. Some kids, a lot of kids, they're going to fall away. And they're going to teach their children the lack of importance in their mind of God's word. And this problem of people falling away from God and his word got compounded over the generations. And this is God's brief description of how the world went awry and how the world was at the state it was when Noah lived. It wasn't just a problem out, out there in the world. God looked at humanity. He saw a problem and that problem started in the home with the family, that basic building block of society, and it spread out from there. He saw how violence and moral decay became rampant on the earth. So what did God do about it? He waited. He waited 120 years and, and let that evil continue. This was the world that Noah lived in. Danger on all sides. Danger to, to his life from the violence of his peers. Danger to his well-being and his family from a society of people that didn't care about what was wrong and right in God's eyes, but only cared about what they could get from this world. And then, of course, the worst danger was the danger to his soul from the allure of the sinful lifestyle of his peers. In a culture like this, what was Noah to do? What, what did his future look like? When we see evil around us when we look around, when we see violence all but unchecked, even excused, when we see moral decay, even in here, the twisting of evil into good and, and good into evil, the poor neglected, the innocent killed, what are we to do? Nothing has changed, has it? We face the same draw to sin that Noah did. But when we see the evils of society, the threats to our faith. What kind of refuges do, we, refuges do we search for? Do we lash out and attack our fellow sinners, and sometimes our fellow saints, as if our fight is against them? Do we join into that culture because we hear those whispers of Satan, God isn't coming back yet. You have time to live, you have time to enjoy it, and, and you'll be safe. It's often that we try to find safety and security and anything and everything but Christ. And what we do instead is end up more confused, we end up more guilty and not any better off than before. Noah had a dilemma. He faced something terrible and God saw that. He saw the danger to this Christian, to his family, and so in his own patient timeline, God acted. He came to save. He came to judge in the same act. For the unbelieving world who had turned their backs on God, who had given up caring about what God said was good, that flood was proof that God hates sin. It was proof that he hates the sinner who does the sin, and he will come in judgment on that sinner with a power that cannot be stopped. But for Noah and his family, it was different, wasn't it? God described Noah as a righteous man. And we have to take a second to, to look at why that is. I mean, when you look at Noah, we know he was a sinner just, just like you and I am. A couple chapters after this, 
after Genesis chapter 6, when Noah is out of the ark, right? After he had witnessed everything that God had done, we see a Noah who is passed out, naked and drunk. Noah was a sinner, just like you and I. So how is it that God calls Noah a righteous man? Well, the same way that God calls us, who are also sinners, a righteous man. See, God had a love for Noah and for you and me today. He provided for Noah a refuge. He had Noah build an ark. And the water that was for the unbelievers, judgment, for Noah, this water was grace. It was love. In the safety of that ark, God, or Noah and his family were spared while God used that water to wash away all the threats of violence, all the moral apathy, all the sinful allure of that generation of his peers. That ark was the tool God used to keep Noah and his family safe from sin of his generation and from the judgment that God brought against that sin. So what does that have to do with us today? What does this flood a couple thousand years ago have to do with the future of Christians living today? Well, in that ark was, was something else, something other than the animals. In that ark was the church. Yeah, it was a small church. It's eight people. But that church carried some very, very important things. In that ark was the word of God, the promise of the Savior that God wanted handed down from generation to generation, that promise of the ultimate answer to sin. And by saving Noah and his family, God preserved the bloodline of the one who would be born in a manger, born to die, but in dying would crush that serpent's head. So that ark, it held safe both the church and the Savior. Lutheran theologians across the history of the church, Luther himself, a man named Johann Gerhard especially, they, they talked very poetically about the church being an ark. And other Christians throughout history have, have used this concept too. You see it even in church design. The classic A-frame church design. It was made to look like the upside-down hull of a boat, complete with exposed beams to, to look like ribs. The part of the congre or the part of the building that the congregation sits in is called the nave, fr from the Latin word navis, which means ship. Think navy. But the architecture of the building, it's not just done for the sake of a nice-looking building, right? It's done to teach a theological truth, and that truth is, the church. No matter what the building looks like, it's the gathering of believers to proclaim who God is and what he has done for mankind. The church is the place where God keeps us safe, both from being buffeted around by, by the winds of this world, the philosophies, the thoughts, the opinions, and ultimately safe from his judgment by being the place where that gospel is proclaimed. In the church, you have a place to flee when you're despairing about what the future holds, when you give in to the temptations that you are bombarded with every single day. You can flee to the place where the cross of Christ is proclaimed, the cross where God put to death his own son so that we would be spared from the judgment that our sins deserve. That cross is why Paul could write about us Everybody who believes in the Savior, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The cross means that you, dear Christian, you are safe from God's judgment. And the church, your church, is the tool that he's given to keep you safe. Because through the proclamation of the word of the gospel, he keeps you wrapped up, hidden in Christ. And there, your future is safe, now and in that unknown future. Because it is wrapped up in Christ, it's safe from evil and ultimately safe from the judgment that is to come. 
Now, of course, that judgment hasn't come. We're, we're waiting for that. God has a way of doing things in his own time. And it's really a mercy delaying his judgment. Look at the account of Noah again. From, from the time God resolved to end the corruption on the earth until he actually sent the flood was 120 years. I think it's safe to say that's longer than, than you and I are probably going to live. It's a long time. And I'm not saying that it was easy for Noah to wait that 120 years. He must have been plagued by doubts and by worries. Questions like, what's going to happen? Is this thing actually going to happen? Questions of why would God continue to let evil thrive? Right, 120 years is a long time for Noah and his family to be surrounded by violence and by evil having their faith attacked. At least that's one way to look at it. I think a better way to look at this time is the way the Apostle Peter describes Noah. He describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And to add to this picture of what happened in those 120 years, the writer to the Hebrews says, By building the ark, Noah condemned the world. So this glimpse that God gives us of these 120 years is one where we see Noah, the messenger of law and gospel to his generation. That big boat, think about it for a minute. God could have ended sin. He could have ended the human race in any way that he chose. Use your imagination. But he had Noah build a boat probably in an area that had no water deep enough to even float the thing. What was the master teacher? What was our God doing? Well, that boat served as a pretty fantastic object lesson for the proclamation of law and gospel, didn't it? You see that boat there? God is going to bring judgment on sin. But that big boat there is the place where God wants to save you. For 120 years, God's grace led him to wait patiently while his church, Noah and his family, proclaimed God's word to their generation, pleading for people to repent, for their future to be safe in that ark. So for Noah, that meant for 70 to 80 years of ark building, he faithfully, with holy fear in his heart, did the job God gave him to be a messenger of the gospel. And he went about doing that by going about his daily business, trusting in God's promises. But every day, waking, eating, working, sleeping, serving his God by witnessing to his fellow man with his vocation in his life. Like Noah, you and I are waiting for that last day. The day when God's judgment comes that seems so long in coming. In the meantime, we live in a sinful world where we, we don't even know the powers of evil that stand against us. Evil seeking to overthrow God's church. Temptation from without, from within, trying to, to take us out of God's hand. Are you worried about what the future holds for you, for the church? Maybe a better way to look at this present age is to remember whose church it is you belong to. Emmanuel Redeemer is God's church, where he has chosen to do his life-saving work, and he's doing it through you, his church. You live out your lives wherever God has placed you in this world while God patiently waits. And in the meantime, his church, you, you witness to family, to friends, to all the people that God puts in your life simply by being a Christian, by going about the work that God has called you to do. And God patiently waits while his church does its work. It does its work through the preaching of the word, through the use of the tools he's given the church, the sacraments. From the church's beginning to today and to the unknown future until God comes is to use those tools. Your mission is the same as that of Noah's. While you are waiting for that judgment to come, and it will, proclaim the word of God. The law that points us to our sins, the coming judgment, and the grace 
of God that wants every single soul safe in the ark of the church now and, and safe with God for eternity. How Think about it. How many souls are safe because of the faithful ministry, not only of just pastors at Emmanuel Redeemer, but of every single member? What a privilege to, to be the tool that God uses for this. But what about that, that unknown future? Well, it's in God's hands, isn't it? So you know your future is safe. Amen. We pray. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness, I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished task, uh, tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen.